Good morning. And grace and peace to you. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We welcome you to our worship service here today. Special welcome to any guests or visitors who might be with us today. We'd encourage you, as well as everyone, to sign in on the registration cards that you can find in the pews. We'd also like to welcome those who are listening in to our videotape ministry, those at Sibley Specialty Care, Hartwood Heights, as well as uh, Countryview Manor, and those who are listening in uh, at home as well. I do have a few announcements to draw your attention to. Uh, it is Christ the King Sunday, and we are going to be celebrating communion today. Also notice that uh, we have two offerings today. The first offering will be for the property needs offering, for those needs that uh, come up for things that are outside our regular budget for property concerns. And then the second offering will be for our mission offering. Also notice uh, there's a reminder about our song fest sign up. We have that coming this coming Monday at on uh, November 27th and it'll start at six o'clock at Hartwood Heights. So uh, please uh, take note of that. There's still a room on the sign up sheet for anyone who would like to sing. Also take note of our advent uh, schedule as posted in the bulletin. And I had uh, Sonia Ernst wanted to give an announcement about the blessing wall. Good morning, everyone. Make sure that's on. The total that we had for the blessing wall um, for this past year was 5,273 blessings that. Um, the church family um, wrote on the pieces of paper and we, and we have it displayed in the fellowship hall. So if after church service you would like to, to look at those. And at first I thought, oh, I'm disappointed we didn't get our, our goal of 10,000. But this last month, um, leave it to a child. Um, Jesus tells us to think and be like a, a child. We had this one put in this week and it was in a child's handwriting and it says, Eviani in the world. So. There's a lot there, so we did um, reach way over um, the 10,000 reasons to be thankful. They are from moms to dads to grandparents, families and friends. There was a lot of just the church family listed as a blessing. And just join us for coffee. We have coffee, we have cake and bars afterwards that we can, can celebrate, celebrate this. So. Okay. Thank you, Sonia. Also, uh, thank you to uh, the people that helped with our Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, we served uh, a record number this year of 305 uh, people were served along with our 30 uh, people that were working. So uh, it kind of felt like we were feeding the 5,000 there for a little while, but uh, we ended up, uh, I think the only thing we had to purchase was uh, beans, green beans. So it went over very well. So thank you to everyone who helped with that. For announcements uh, uh, concerning prayer concerns, uh, we had one, uh, actually two that, that went out. Uh, one is for Ray Kruger. Uh, Ray Kruger fell over Thanksgiving and he broke uh, three ribs. Uh, he also broke, um, uh, I don't have it written down, a collarbone um, and a vertebrae as well as lacerated his liver and he's in the hospital at the university of Minnesota, so uh, please pray for him. Uh, so he's quite banged up, and pray for his recovery and health. Also for Lyle Funk of um, California, um, he's also uh, experiencing some difficulties. He's been moved into a care facility and has trouble adjusting, so pray for him. Uh, the rest of those are uh, the same other than Bob Thompson is now at home. He went home on Monday, so uh, continue to pray for him. Those are the joys and concerns that I have. Any others that anyone else has? Yes. Oh, yes. Yesterday we had the, uh, the parade of, uh, it wasn't really called the Parade of Lights, but it was our first Christmas parade, and the FOC had a great float. Uh, with a live nativity on it, so thank you to them who did that. So, Anything else? If not, let us stand and greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ. Good 
morning. Hey, Bob. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? Yep. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. Yep. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. How are you? Please join us in the call to worship. Lift your heads, people of God. Behold the King of glory. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, the eternal God, is the King of glory. We lift our heads, we bow our knees, and we open our hearts to worship the King of glory. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Please bow our heads in prayer. Gracious and all-powerful God, we come into your presence acknowledging you as king, and in so doing, acknowledge ourselves as your people. Through the life of your son, Jesus Christ, you showed yourself to be a servant king, a king for whom love and mercy, humility and grace, faith and faithfulness were a way of life, and you call us to the same. Remind us that it is in self-sacrifice, not in self-promotion, that we will find joy, that it is in not our weakness, that is in our weakness that we will receive your spirit and be made strong. That is in giving up our delusions of control and trusting in you that we will find peace and security, which we so desperately seek. Grant us the wisdom and the courage to listen and obey. Amen. Our opening hymn is Rejoice the Lord is King, number 228, and words are on the screen. <laughs> Please join me in the unison prayer of confession. O King of kings, 
ruler of all. It is sometimes hard to understand words of truth, particularly in the midst of all the voices in our lives. We confess that although we willingly say that Jesus is king of our life, we often fail to bend our knees before him and trust in him fully. Grant us the humility to bow before you, the ruler of all nations, so that we may be loyal servants in your kingdom, bound to his world, to the schedules of calendars and the limits of bank accounts. We struggle to conceive of a kingdom beyond what we know. Forgive us for not taking the servant nature of reaching out to all of those who are lost, hungry, sick, and in need. May we hear you call beyond our worldly boundaries, past the identities we construct for ourselves, to be witnesses of the life-changing truth. Lord of our lives, rule us and show others a glimpse of your kingdom. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. And Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is in a new creation. The old life has gone. The new life has begun. Friends, believe in the good news of the gospel. For in the name of Jesus Christ, we are truly forgiven. Amen. Jesus, we just want to thank you.
Thank you, Kaylin. And at this time, we will have our uh, first offering, and our first offering will be for our special needs or our property needs fund, and we'll have the ushers come forward at this time. Old Testament reading is 1 Samuel 8, verses 4 through 10, page 429 in your Bibles and 309 in the Children's Bible. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them out up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who are asking him for a king. The New Testament reading is Revelations 20, verses 11 through 15, page 1936 in the NIV Bible, and page 14, 
1400 in your children's Bible. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and, the, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were ju judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the, the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown through into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is a second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The hymn of preparation is Jesus Shall Reign, number 233. Words are on the screen. Please remain standing for our gospel reading. This is our lectionary text for today. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Hear now the word of the Lord. And when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left, and then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick in prison and, and go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, and in the into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick in prison and, and did not help you? And he will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. They will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, use us, fill us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. As you may have already uh, just heard, the lectionary text on Matthew is a difficult text on a, a number of levels. And it's the, the last of Jesus' parables that he tells. And some actually skip over this, uh, this at, at, at all because they don't like the message of judgment that they heard. Others consider its outcome, the separation of the sheep and the goats, too harsh to preach on. But for us to ignore judgment from a biblical perspective would, would actually be quite ridiculous. Billy Graham said, there are hundreds of passages that point to a time of judgment for every person who has ever lived. He says, none are going to escape this. If you took all the references to judgment out of the Bible, he said, we'd have little left in the Bible. Therefore, it is my duty as your pastor to address the Bible in its entirety and to talk about this difficult subject of judgment. And the reason some don't like this uh, and consider it a parable is because it doesn't begin with the usual, the kingdom of heaven is like. However, in this text, it does talk about, Jesus talks about when the Son of Man comes into his glory, that he will sit on his throne in a heavenly glory. Certainly, it's talking about the heaven, the kingdom of heaven. But some take this to believe Jesus was talking about his second coming. Others take this, that this will happen after Jesus takes the punishment that was meant for us that when he dies on the cross, that he rises from the grave and ascends into heaven, and it's when he's placed then on the throne at the right hand of God the Father. I tend to like the second in which Jesus is talking about when he's going to come into his glory um, and sit on his heavenly throne as he is raised up by God in his ascension. Now, it's important to recognize that Jesus is telling this story only just a few days before he is actually arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when Jesus goes to the cross, he's going to the cross for all people, all the world. John 3.16 tells us this, for God so loved the world, not just the Jews, not just the Christians, but all of the world. There it would make sense that all the nations, all of humanity, living in the world, are going to have to come before him as the king and be judged. This is not the first reference in the Bible about God being our king. You may have heard in our reading from the Old Testament, from 1 Samuel, when uh, the people asked uh, Samuel about a king, it was God who said, they're not rejecting you, Samuel, they're rejecting me as their king. It was God had established that he was going to be the king of his people, but they rejected him. And so Samuel is, is concerned about this. He prays to God, and he said, God tells him to tell them that the king, earthly king, is not always going to treat you fairly and will be difficult for you here on earth. Nevertheless, 
they still demanded a king. And just as Samuel then went out to anoint Saul as Israel's first king, Jesus, only days before he is arrested, um, is also anointed as king, and he is prepared for the sacrifice he is about to make. What's interesting is Jesus knows what's ahead of him here. He will definitely earn his right to be called the king of glory. And one assumes that then, as well as now, that the majority of the people do not know that they behold the king when they look at Jesus. For at the time Jesus speaks these words, he's not recognized by many that he's king. Only one really acknowledges him as king, and it's Pilate, and he does it in a, in a mocking way as he has the sign hung above, above him on the cross, King of the Jews. Moreover, the idea that we're all going to have to come before Jesus as our king and be judged is discerning for some. Because of that, some, pre some preachers actually downplay this event, and instead they say, hey, you don't have anything to worry about. God is a God of love, uh, and he loves us all. He died for us all, so we're all going to go to heaven. So it really doesn't matter um, what we do. Besides, all you have to do is treat others like you would yourself, be kind to the poor, help those who are suffering, take care of those in need, just be a good person, and that's all you need to do. And one of the commentaries that I was reading um, actually picked up this point and ignored the part that Jesus is to be our king. Instead, it focused on what Jesus was saying about works righteousness, Emphasizing Jesus' point that all you got to do is be good to a person, kind to the poor, help the needy. Basically, it's the love your neighbor as yourself, and everything will be okay. Furthermore, he claimed that all nations is a reference to those nations other than the Jews or the Jewish Christians, and that he claimed that even a Muslim who doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in Jesus, can take and as long as they're doing good to others it's basically a good person was going to receive eternal life as he was focusing entirely on you did it to the least of these you did it unto me I was appalled at what I was reading in this in this commentary how could a pastor who is a minister of the Christian faith allow for such hypocrisy if it doesn't matter what we believe or who we believe in, only that our life reflects a good person, wow. I mean, wow. To ignore that is to ignore a whole lot of what's in the Bible about God's word. I and mean, just take the one instance in John 14 where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one. No one comes to the Father, except through me. And recently, my, my wife actually showed me a post where Tony Campolo's son, Bart, uh, who was a, a faithful Christian, has rejected the faith of his father. He's now an atheist, or should I say, he no longer believes in God, he prefers that, and he currently works as a humanist chaplain. You might wonder, what's a humanist chaplain or a humanist? A humanist is somebody who believes that you can have a good life without God and that everything's going to be okay. Apparently, uh, for Bard, after experiencing unanswered prayers and working in an urban poverty and seeing that there was no change in his world, despite all the work he was doing, all the prayers that he had, he had to change his outlook on life. And he began to adjust his theology to match his reality. This was the beginning of the end for his faith. Campolo is now predicting as many as 40% of progressive Christians will become atheists over the next decade. In, in his view, the process of abandoning Christian doctrines, and you see the building box of Christian doctrines there. You start pulling them out, you have no foundation to stand on, and all of it crumbles down to nothing. And he said that, this doing this is almost addictive for some people to kind of want to pull things out he says once you start there's no way to stop that is what the pastor was doing in this commentary trying to adjust his theology to match his reality that's what we must avoid 
It's just too way hard for him to believe that a loving God was going to allow kind people to be separated like livestock in this text, saying that if they're good people, no matter what they do, even if they're a Muslim or an atheist, if they do good to others, they're going to have eternal life. This is a humanist principle and belief that's popular out there these days. Please let us not go down this slippery slope. For those who make this claim of a watered-down faith, of just doing good, do not know simply what it means to make Jesus king of your life. Jesus is claiming the title of king here in this text. He's claiming the title of king that the Israelites abandoned way back in 1 Samuel. And he can do that claim, he can make that claim because of the sacrifice that he's about to make on behalf of the people. <clears throat> After all, our, our, um, we didn't have this reading, but from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, Paul tells us that Jesus leaves his deity, he leaves his kingdom, and he comes down to earth to become like one of us. He takes on a servant nature and gives us an example of how we are to live our life. He lived a selfless, obedience life, and he died a selfless, obedient death faithful to the very end, and he died one of the worst deaths one could have, crucifixion. And because of that, Jesus raised him up and brought him into heaven, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord, that he is Lord. Jesus, as King of kings, as Lord of lords, as Savior of the world, is compelling us to mimic his behavior the life he lived here on earth. Jesus' lists of you did it to me are all things that Jesus did while he was here on earth. They're all examples of how we are to reach out and care for one another. And we should reach out to the lost with the same kind of passion that Jesus had in going to the cross for us. It should become second nature for us to reach those who are down and out. Mother Teresa once came up uh, with this idea. She talked to visitors, and she said, uh, I want you all to raise your hand, uh, and I'm going to ask you to do that too. Everybody raise, raise your right hand. We're not swearing to anything. We're just using this as an example. She said, these five fingers on your hand contain the gospel message. They are, you did it to me. You did it to me. At the end of your life, these five fingers are going to either accuse you or excuse you in regard doing it to the least of these. You did it to me. You can put your hand out. The gospel, if you notice in this, Mother Teresa is not abandoning her theology to match her reality. She talks about the gospel. And so the gospel of Jesus Christ is the belief that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and that he is our King of Kings and that she brings out the idea of the separation of the accused and the accused as that of the sheep and the goats. The part we tend to cringe at, though, in this text that Matthew has that Jesus is talking about is that there's such a drastic difference from those who are saved to those who are lost. It's... Is stark. The cursed, the accused, the goats are going to go where? Into an eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The righteous, the excused, the sheep are going to receive eternal life. We like the idea of eternal life. That all gives us comfort. It makes us feel good to know that someday we'll get to have eternal life. But the idea of an eternal fire frightens us or at least it should, because it is real. Our reading from Revelation confirms everything Jesus says in this parable. Jesus, as the Son of God, is seated on the throne. There's a scene of judgment based on what each person has done. If their name is not in the book of life, they were thrown into the lake of fire, along with the beasts of Satan and all the false prophets who could be those who were professing Christ, but we're preaching something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
believe me, there is an eternal fire. There is a hell, no matter what people say. It does matter. It does matter what we believe and who we believe in. Our actions must match our belief. Otherwise, we're just like the hypocrites or the Pharisees were in many of the combatants that Jesus had with them. And we, we are all going to be judged more severely because we already know the truth of Jesus Christ. And in myself, as a minister of the word and sacrament, I will be held to an even sharper edge. This is serious stuff. This idea that Christ is the King. So Christ the King Sunday reminds us what really matters is who we truly serve in our life. And so now history and our own salvation are hanging in the balance. One day we are all going to have to stand before the judge and answer this question. Who is King of your life? Who is King of your life? Does everything we say or do match that belief? I hope so, for that is what Jesus is encouraging us to follow, to follow him as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Our future depends upon it. Amen. Let us continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and our offering. Our reading from the scripture is Psalm 50, verse 14, which says, Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High.
Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, on this Christ the King Sunday, we acknowledge that all we have is yours. May these gifts we lay before you be but a token of our appreciation for all you have done for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. We use these gifts to further your kingdom here on earth. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd ask that you remain standing for our invitation to the Lord's table. Friends, this before us is a joyful feast of the people of God, and they're going to come from the east and the west, from the north and from the south, to sit at this table at the kingdom of God. And according to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, and he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, their eyes were open, and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table before us. And our Savior invites all those who are baptized and trust in his Lord and Savior to partake of this feast which has been prepared for you. And as we do, for, do so today, I would ask you to uh, think about how Christ is the Lord of your life and what that means to follow him as we take this sacrament of his. Our communion hymn is uh, number 321, according to your gracious word. be seated. Will you please join me in that great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And, also with you. and lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And let us pray. You exalted the risen Christ to rule over all of creation, O Lord, that we might present to you, that was presented to you as an eternal and universal kingdom, a kingdom of life, a kingdom of holiness and grace, a kingdom of justice and love and peace that should apply to our lives. How wonderful are your ways, almighty God. How marvelous is your name, O Holy One. You alone are God. Therefore, with the prophets and the apostles and the great cloud of witnesses who live for you beyond all time and space, we lift our hearts in joyful praise, saying together, Holy, 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 holy Lord, 
God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And we praise you, most holy God, for sending your son Jesus to live among us, full of grace and truth. He made you known to all who receive him, sharing our joy and sorrow. He healed the sick. He was a friend of the sinners. He obeyed you and took up his cross and died that we might live. We praise you that he overcame death and has risen to rule the world. He is still the friend of sinners. And we trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us and believe that when he comes in his glory, we will celebrate his victory with him. Hear us now as we pray for those in our community who are in need of your healing hand, as we pray for uh, Pastor Ray Kruger, for Lyle Funk, for Connie Wagner, for Barb LaCour, Bob Thompson, for Esther Ernst, Sailor McCour, Novina Popkes, Elijah Jansma, for Pam Wolmuth and any others, Lord, that are on our heart, we lift up to you for healing at this time. We pray for anyone who is going through a sense of loss, especially as uh, we've come through Thanksgiving and we approach uh, the Advent and Christmas season. We pray that you would, uh, for those joys that you have bestowed upon us, for the bountiful harvest that we have received. And gracious God, we pour, pray now that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that this bread and this cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord, and that we and all who share in this feast may be one with Christ and he with us. Fill us with eternal life, that with joy we may be your faithful people until we feast with you in glory. Hear us now as we pray that prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear these words as they were written by the Apostle Paul. Our Lord Jesus, on the night of his rest, he took the bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And every time you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and those who come to me shall not hunger. Those who believe in me shall never thirst. Eat of it.
Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Drink of it. <clears throat> Let us pray. O Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us your peace. Most loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, that you have united us with Christ and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out now in the power of your Spirit to live and to work, to praise and to give you glory in all that we say and do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll stand for our closing hymn, Worship Christ the Risen King, number 225, words will be on the screen. Hear now this benediction. Go out in the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, render no one evil for evil, support the faint-hearted, strengthen the weak, help those who are suffering, honor God in everything that we do, love and serve the Lord our God, rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.